the waiting time will be four minutes. That's what the automated voice said on the other end of the phone. That's what it promised anyway. But after four minutes of listening to background music, the voice came on the line again to say the waiting time will be four minutes. Another four minutes passed, another four minutes of listening to that wonderful music. And then this voice came out again to interrupt and say that the waiting time will be four minutes. Now it only happened maybe six or seven times. So in all, in all, in all, I was probably only waiting for 30 minutes or so to speak to one of the customer service team. So it could have been much worse. But still, if I'm honest, as you can imagine, there was a little bit of frustration and a little bit of impatience boiling up inside as I waited. Now, I'm sure we've all experienced that kind of thing, eh? You've been on the phone and waiting and waiting and waiting. Anytime we phone up a helpline, anytime we maybe try and phone for a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment, or basically contact any business these days. <coughs> waiting can be difficult, can't it? And I think we're probably getting worse at it these days. In this age when so much is instant. Instant food, instant coffee, instant 24-hour news, instant access to a library of, of entertainment and a world of information. But the problem with all of this is that sometimes we have to wait. Especially to wait for the Lord. And if we're not willing to wait for the Lord, we're in danger of making a mess of our lives. So we're going to read from Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 to 16. If you don't have a Bible, there are some Bibles on the table there if you want to grab one. Uh, But Genesis chapter 16, and Christopher is going to come up and he's going to read it for us uh, this morning. Thank you, Christopher. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You should name, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Berla Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. 
Thank you very much, Christopher. Our reading started with this one, one verse. Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And I think there's so much pain wrapped up in that statement. By this stage, Abram and Sarah had been in Canaan for something like ten years. And for ten years that they'd been waiting, and probably many years before that, they'd been waiting and longing for a child. Ten years of constant disappointment, of questioning and doubt. Starting each month with such hope, only for that hope to be dashed. And childlessness was viewed by many in her day as a curse. And and the, the, the finger of blame was always pointed to the woman. So Sarah probably felt the shame of not providing an heir to her husband. And all this time, the promises of God to Abram must have stuck in her head. I will make you into a great nation. God had promised in chapter 12, verse 2. To your offspring I will give this land. Chapter 12, verse 7. And even more recently, a son coming from your own body will be your heir. Chapter 15, verse 4. But was Sarai included in those promises? And if so, what was she doing wrong? Why wasn't it working? Now Sarai responded really badly to this situation. This morning we're going to look at some of her mistakes and hopefully learn from them. Not to repeat them again in our lives. But I think we do her a real injustice if we don't see how difficult it was for her. These are the words and actions of a disappointed and desperate woman going through an incredibly difficult time. And I think that we're often like her. Because waiting is part of all of our Christian lives. Waiting for answered prayer. Waiting for healing. Waiting for a life partner. Waiting for justice in the face of accusation and attack. Waiting for a family member to come to the Lord. Waiting for heaven. And many of us struggle with this waiting. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 verse 23. (coughs) Excuse me. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. Yes, we we can enjoy so many of the blessings of Christ right now. We can experience much of His love and joy and peace in our lives. But we don't have it all yet. There's more to come. And sometimes we get tired of waiting. We get hurt, we get disappointed, we get desperate. But it's so important that we learn to wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord, as Psalm 27 says. Wait because Sarah shows us the mess that can happen if we fail to wait on the Lord. Sarah felt that she could not wait any longer. She was desperate for a child, and yet she said, the Lord has kept me from having children. 
But instead of accepting that God had a plan in this delay, like we were thinking about last week, how God can work in in the delays, instead of accepting that, she came up with a desperate plan to have a child through her servant Hagar. Perhaps, she said, I can build a family through her. God had promised to build a great nation from Abram. So Sarah was just giving God a helping hand. She was just taking a little shortcut to that end. And we can be tempted to try to do the same with God. We want to experience God's best for our lives. But we just want to get there a little bit quicker. We want a shortcut to maturity. Or a quick road to success. But shortcuts aren't always a good idea. You ever taken a shortcut that Google Maps suggested? Only to find yourself on this tiny, narrow, bumpy road. Or maybe come up to a dead end. Shortcuts don't always work out in our lives. And the walk of faith calls us to rely on God. Not on our own ingenuity and strategy. This very famous verse, Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. A guy called Pete Quist, he says this, Faith is living without scheming. Living without scheming. Trusting in God, not trying to work it all out ourselves. We can depend on God to accomplish His will and His way. Shortcuts are never a road to success with God. Now Sarah's suggestion here is kind of shocking to us, I think. Suggesting that Abram kind of marries her servant. But it didn't seem to shock Abram. And this is probably because it wasn't that unusual in his day. In fact, documents from around that time period... They, they record that what Sarai suggested here was a legal practice according to the marriage code of the day. A childless woman could give her maid to her husband and the child that would be born from that, that marriage would be classed as the first wife's child. So if other people in that area heard about what Sarai was doing they would have probably found it quite acceptable. They might even have thought it her responsibility to make sure her husband would have an heir. But right, according to this world, is not always right according to God. God had called Abram and Sarah to to leave the world to leave its ways and to follow Him. And God's plan for marriage was always for an exclusive, lifelong commitment of one man and one woman. Always. Way back in Genesis chapter 2, God had said, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And they will become one flesh. But in this moment, Abram wasn't looking for God's will. Before, in his life, Abram had asked God what his will was. But this time, there's no record of Abram or Sarai asking God for guidance. It seems they were following the wisdom of this world. Rather than God. You ever been tempted to do the same? When we face unmet desires or delays or disappointments, are we ever ever tempted to follow this world rather than God? 
try to solve our financial problems through maybe cheating on our taxes or claiming benefits that we're not entitled to or playing the lottery or look to drugs and alcohol to help us to cope with the stress, the stress and the pressure or the boredom of our lives or meet our need for love and companionship in the wrong way? Or listen to false teachers and their their, their promises of, of a life that's blessed and getting everything you want rather than trusting in God? That's what Satan tempted Jesus to do in the wilderness. To shortcut the suffering and experience the glory without the cross. All this I will give you, Satan said to Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me. So the world may say that it's okay to do this. They may even even say that we're entitled to do it, that that it's our right. But we're called to follow God. And not this world. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12. And this may mean that we have to choose the harder way. It may mean that we go on the narrow road. It may mean a costly decision. But ultimately it's the better road because God's will is His good and pleasing And perfect well. So we can trust that his ways are best. Even if they're tough. And going outside of God's will. Always causes problems. We see that in Sarah's life here. She was trying to build a family. And initially our plan seemed to be working. But instead our actions started to tear our family apart. When Hagar found that she was pregnant, she she began to despise her mistress, it says in verse 4. She used her success to ridicule Sarai. And Hagar's actions then brought Sarai and Abram into conflict. And down through this conflict, this, down through the centuries, this conflict has continued. Many of the Arabs, they claim to have been descendants of a, a, the, this, this son born to Hagar. And we all know the conflict between them and the children of, Ab- the other children of Abram. There is a way that seems right to a man, Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 says. But in the end, it leads to death. There's a way that looks right, that looks great, that looks to answer all of our needs and desires. But in the end, it leads to disaster. Going outside of God's will will always cause us problems. It may not be seen immediately, but eventually it will be obvious. That no matter how good it appeared, abandoning God's plan is always a disaster. In the middle of this conflict, we might have hoped that this this faith family would have turned to God for help. But instead, they tried to fix it themselves. Sarai, she completely ignored her responsibility in this, this mess. And instead attacked Abram, her husband. Blaming him completely for the situation. You are responsible for the the wrong I am suffering, she said in verse 5. Then she started to abuse Hagar. Abram, for his part, well he stepped back from his responsibility as the head of his family. And left Hagar in the hands of bitter and twisted and, and angry Sarai. Your servant is in your hands, 
He said, do with her whatever you think best. He just turned his back while others did wrong. And Hagar, well, she did the only thing that she felt she could. She fled from her. Verse 6. When God met her, she was on the road to Shur, on the border of Egypt. She was heading back home, back to where she had come from, hoping that she could make a better life there. I wonder if you recognise any of those responses to the problems that are caused by our sin. You ever found yourself blaming and hitting out at others? Dodging your responsibility? Running away from your problems? There are such human responses. It's how Adam and Eve responded when God confronted their sin. Adam said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit and from the tree and I ate it. Blaming both God and his wife. And Eve said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. Such a human response for us to do that, to blame others, to head out at them, to dodge responsibility, to run from our problems. But the problem is, we'll never experience recovery that way. We'll not be restored until we face up to our responsibility, face up to our guilt, and bring it to God. This is what David experienced. He wrote about it in Psalm 32. He said, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That's the only way to experience that restoration. So this family was falling apart. But God in his grace stepped in. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar. Hagar learned some incredible lessons that day. Abram had turned his back and allowed Sarah to treat Hagar unfairly, but she learned that God sees the suffering of people. She called him, You are the God who sees God saw Hagar put into this impossible situation. He saw her poor reaction to it. He saw the mistreatment of of her mistress. He saw her hiding in the desert. And God sees us too. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. We may feel invisible to others. But God is always watching over us. Always. Hagar also learned that God hears the cries of our hearts. God told her to call her son Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard of your misery. David wrote, the Lord hears the needy. He hears the cries of our hearts. He hears our desperate prayers for help. But Hagar didn't only learn that God sees and God hears. He also learned that God comes to help. This angel, or this messenger, appears to be the Lord himself. Because he promises Hagar only what God can do. And he is called the Lord in verse 13. So it's incredible to think how the value that God places on this Egyptian servant and her unborn child. 
Sarai abused her. Abram abandoned her. But God in his grace came to help her. When she thought she was on her own, God showed that he was right there with her. And this is who our God is. Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus saw our need. He heard our cries. And in love, he came to us to lay down his life for us. So that if we put our faith in him, then we can know that we will never be alone. We can know that he is watching over us when we're despised. He cares for us when we are neglected. He doesn't desert us even when we mess up. He's committed himself to us in his covenant of grace. And he's willing to come to us in our time of need. But God didn't just rescue Hagar. Finally, he also called her to repent. Go back to your mistress and submit to her. She had to go back to where Abram and Sarai was living. But even more than that, she had to go back into the role that she had in that family to submit to Sarai. God would deal with, with Sarai's faults, but Hagar had to face up to her responsibility. She had to repent. This was difficult. It was a call for to to turn back from her present direction and walk in God's way for her life. But it was also a call to blessing. Verse 10 says, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Her son Ishmael was not the child of the promise given to Abram. But because he was Abram's son, he would still be blessed. Hagar had to put her life in God's hands, believing that God would keep his promise. And God would bless her. And God would protect her. And incredibly, this is what Hagar did. She put her faith in God. And as a result, she gave birth to a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to him in obedience to what God said. And if we've gone on the wrong track, if we've taken a wrong turn in our lives, if we've tried to take a shortcut, if we've followed this world, if we've gone off track with God, And this is his recovery path. As Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, remember the heights from which you have fallen. Repent. And do the things you did at first. We need to accept our responsibility. Return back to where God wants us to be. Submit to his will even when it's hard. And allow him to lead us in the way of blessing. So this is the good news here. There's a way back to God, even if we've made a mess of our lives. But it's much better not to make that mess in the first place. Sarai and Abram could have saved themselves and their family and so many other people a great deal of pain and heartache if they'd just trusted in the Lord, if they'd just chosen to wait on Him.
This is what we need to do today. As we face the delay, the the not yet of our Christian lives, we need to wait on God's timing and not try and run ahead. We need to follow God's will without trying to look for shortcuts or follow the world's way. We need to make sure that we don't abandon God's way because it's it's the only way that leads to life in its fullness. And we need to trust in God's grace. That he sees us. That he hears our cries. And that he will come to work in our lives at the right time.